and welcome. This is Tuesday, September 22nd. This is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives. And today we are going to be reviewing the, uh, the budget bill as passed the Senate. And I think we're going to have um, Chloe from JFO go through the numbers with us, looking at the difference between the House and, and uh, Senate proposals. Chloe, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. <laughs> oh, I was muted that whole time. <laughs> yeah, you were. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Uh, good morning, Chloe Wexler from the Joint Fiscal Office. Um, Philip, thank you for pulling up this sheet. Um, this is supposed to just be a quick depiction of um, the appropriations as we left in the Q1 budget, um, in the House restatement, and in the Senate restatement. Um, so in the first line, you'll see the HVAC efficiency of, of Vermont appropriation, which initially was 6.5 million. This was increased to 11.5 million by the House, and the Senate further increased that to 13.5 million due to, um, you know, testimony from Efficiency Vermont um, and their ability to utilize those funds. Um, we then come down to the K-12 schools appropriation, and this is a little bit tricky just in how, um, in how there was a couple of sub-appropriations within that, but what you'll see is that in total in the Q1 budget, there was $41 million appropriated to K-12 schools. The House further increased that to 68.4, and then one more increase in the Senate restatement to 88.3. And um, that was really based on, you know, as information was coming available from the agency on the applications that schools had submitted, um, it looked like there was, you know, there was that need in the schools. Um, in the initial Q1 budget, there was an appropriation for summer meals. And so that was up to $12 million. That remains the same. The program actually closed in August and AOE has indicated that that program has used about 2.2 million. Um, the CRF and, um, and that they also noted that they have additional um, eligible expenses related to meal service. And so a, um, for a, a sub appropriation of up to $4 million was passed in both the House and Senate version. Um, we then come to the final two appropriations for independent schools um, and accounting. The independent schools, they were eligible to receive a capped amount per pupil, per publicly funded pupil, at 40, uh, $422 per publicly funded student. Um, they, uh, you know, that actually ends up working out to be a funding request of about um, 1.17 million. So the Senate decreased that appropriation to 1.2 million. Um, and the same goes for accounting and technical assistance. It was noted that that money was not being used and was available actually just for direct reimbursement to schools. So that appropriation was zeroed out. Um, they, <laughs> There was a, a in the house as it left, there was a provision that reallo that allowed for reallocation of the funds. So sort of recognizing that there may be money available in some of the house appropriations, but rather than changing those appro appropriations, they just allowed for the flexibility of funds through to move throughout the appropriations. The Senate decided that they would rather just adjust the appropriations and um, to their suitable level and, and you know, not get into the reallocation language. Um, and that is the general summary of what was done. Are there any questions? Can you um, speak about the gear money and CTEs? Um, sure. So uh, the gear money was a, um, the governor's education emergency relief fund there was about $4.5 million available 
um, the administration, and I believe they've actually sent over this grant to the Joint Fiscal Committee for approval, um, but they stated that these funds would be made available to career and technical institutions. Um, it was, This sort of coincides with also one change that I, I did um, forget to address, which is that um, both the House and Senate have added language to um, amend the definition for a K-12 school. Um, and it was amended to include regional technical um, centers because there are actually three technical centers that are not directly affiliated with a school district. And so they were initially inadvertently left out um, uh, of, of that definition. So Chloe, they can, uh, uh, yes. A question there. So it felt that fell under K-12 and not under independent schools for those three. They just got swept into yes. K-12. Okay. Yes. Okay, I interrupted you. Did you want to finish that sentence? No, uh, that um, it just is a, n a note that they, they are exactly like you said, now included in that K-12 schools line. Um, and treated similarly as the other career and technical centers that are affiliated with the school district. Chip Conquest from Appropriations. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, so Chloe, it says uh, with that double asterisk at the bottom that, that the administration says the gear money will be available to the career and tech institutions to support new initiatives. Um, I'm wondering, uh, so the you know, the intent, as I understood it in the this House Ed Committee when they were discussing it earlier was to make um, uh, make them available eligible for CRF money um, for all the kinds of purposes that schools might use CRF money. Is this limited to or has the administration indicated that this is really specifically for new initiatives and not well, I actually think that Bill Bates is here, so we can ask him. Um, I, I, um, I don't think it has to be specifically for new initiatives, but um, I think the governor did maybe mention something about that in the beginning. Um, but I think the important sort of delineation is is that their gear money is a little bit more flexible than you know a, a straight CRF dollar, and so it could be it could support you know, other, other not, um, you know, 100%, you know, PPE or CRF expenses, but um, I would happy, I would, I would be happy to hear, you know, what, uh, what Bill and uh, the agency has in mind for that money. Um, Bill Bates, <clears throat> Bill Bates, you're here, I believe. I am. I just had to find the mute button. Yeah, and um, I think that you had some other questions. So why don't we why don't we shoot right now? Sounds good. For the record, Bill Bates, Agency of Education. Thank you for having me this morning. Um, let's uh, talk about uh, the Gear Fund first. That uh, four point four million dollars. Um, what uh, had originally been uh, slated for uh, new initiatives. Um, which is uh, what we were originally thinking of uh, using the funds for has uh, changed over time as we have seen the uh, numbers come in for K-12 schools and the other uh, CRF requests. Um, we are uh, focusing that money on the uh, CTE centers to ensure that uh, their, uh, their needs as far as COVID-19 are met. And so it would not just be limited to uh, support new initiatives, but it would include those costs that we've uh, heard from K-12 schools, the independent schools uh, needing as well. So PPE and, and the likes. Thank you. And then just, just to um, clarify, this is another 4.4 that's going into um, into the tech centers. And I'm wondering, I, I can't remember, I don't have Jim here. As, as I remember, the secretary has um, some discretion on how this money is divided up. Um, is, is he able to include that fact that it just got hit with an extra 4.4 million as he's looking at the needs of, of the other uh, pre-K-12 pre schools? Um, 
Yes, so uh, thank you for asking the question. We, we have taken a look at that. And so we, we are uh, factoring all of that information in when we put together the, uh, the application for gear. Oh, and I see Jim, Jim Demaray is here. Yeah, I was here, Rev. I had this meeting in my head at 10 o'clock, not 8 30. Well, surprise, surprise. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, was. We tricked you. I'm here, though. Yeah. So, the language, so with the additional 4.4 from GEAR, the GEAR funds that are going, the secretary has flexibility uh, to be able to. Um, because that just got a boost that they might be able to take some of the other funds that he might have sent to the CETEs and use those for the pre-K-12 schools. He's got fairly wide uh, ability to use those funds within the CRF guidelines to distribute equitably based on need. That is correct. <laughs> okay, good. And then we also have uh, ESSER, uh, which uh, it's another 30 some odd million dollars. And what's the what's the end date on that? The absolute end date is September of 22. Okay. So we've got the entire school year and summer. Yeah. Yes. That is correct. And yeah. uh, going back to the spreadsheet that Chloe walked through, I just wanted to uh, highlight that uh, under the summer meals line where we've appropriated up to 12 million dollars in the notes, you see that uh, the actual ask was $2.2 .2 million. And so um, in addition to that, the, uh, the, uh, the food program team has asked for an additional four, which is the line below that. And as uh, you can see, all of those numbers roll up into the 68.4, but I did, I did wanna highlight the fact that uh, we only expended 2.2 .2 of the 12 million, so. So that makes the rest of the, whatever it is. Yep. And we also highlighted the accounting and tech, technical assistance um, at, the, at the bottom of that uh, worksheet that Chloe walked through. Um, right. We don't have any uh, asks at this time for that. Um, I, as I remember, that was added at the last minute um, oh. based, based on the, um, the accounting systems that that everybody has been waiting for to be um, the chart of accounts and the other one that has I think six letters in it that I remember <laughs> when we're talking about it and I forget. Um, so the EMS, yes, the e finance plus. There we go. Yeah. So are, how how far along are we with those programs? So we are currently. Uh, done with the chart of accounts we're implementing that so the the work of building a standardized chart of accounts is done um, and those are uh, being implemented across the uh, the leas how the, many have implemented i don't have the uh, answer to that question on the off the top but i can certainly ask the project team and get back to you that would be great yep it's, it's the implementation that will and then, certainly be necessary right and, and, they, and then we're we're in round six of the uh, eFinance Plus, that's SSDDMS. Mm -hmm. and so we have 16 LEAs that are uh, in flight right now. They started 7-1 and they all have a year to implement. Okay. So should that be then by this time next year, are we expected that that's gonna be up and running as well? We will have a, uh, a few, um, LEA is still remaining for round seven and eight, but uh, we'll be pushing close to 70% completion after round six. Okay. And one, one good note to highlight uh, with the eFinance Plus project is the fact that uh, I have worked with our vendor Power School and they have uh, named John Dawson. I don't know if the name rings a bell for anyone on the committee, but uh, he is gonna be the program manager overseeing the entire implementation on the uh, on the power school side which i think is a uh, a good move by the vendor um, it'll ensure that uh, when leas have questions they they get answers uh, from from the vendor I, I do remember that that was lacking in the yep. last round okay yep. 
So um, as we're looking at this then, um, basically, as I understand this, Chloe, that and Jim, that this money all sort of got pulled to, pulled together, <laughs> and rather than then I think the twelve million kind of gets rolled back into the, the the broad picture, correct? And then the four million is pulled out of that. Is that correct? So the way that the language is written at, in the in the current Senate budget, um, all of the funds are sort of it appropriated to K-12 schools. And then there are two sort of sub appropriations of one, which was up to 12 million. But now we know for a fact that only 2.2 has been expended and then up to 4 million for CRF eligible meal service equipment. So if you come down to that, um, well, pointing, pointing at my iPad, if you come down to that um, light beige box at the bottom, that is based on you know those two current estimates of 2.2 million for the summer meals and 4 million for the meal equipment. If you subtract that from the 88.3 in the total, that you know the total, um, it, I think it's like uh, A50 C1, um, then you end up at 82.1, which is the money that's available. Um, right now for the direct K through 12 reimbursement. Okay. Thank you. Any, no problem. Any questions? Chip Conquest. Um, just one more for um, Bill Bates probably. Um, the ESSER money, um, has any of that gone out? And, um, and if so, how much is left? And, and what's the, is there a plan for that particular money? Making sure I'm off mute. So the uh, the ESSER money, we have uh, used our uh, grants management system, GMS system, to uh, administer those grants. The uh, the application out, and uh, we have to date received four requests. It's our uh, it's our belief and understanding that the LEAs have. Uh, Focus their attention, rightfully so, on CR the use of CRF funds because of the uh, very short tail associated with those, and the fact that uh, any funds that are left unspent as of twelve thirty of twenty need to get returned to the treasury. So uh, the uh, the thought, the thinking at the uh, agency level is the fact that uh, we will start seeing additional applications coming in and requests for the uh, the ESSER money, but uh, no money as of today has uh, gone out as far as uh, ESSER is concerned. Okay, um, and is there a particular use that um, the agency is considering that money for or haven't made that? Well, I'll end there. Oh, no, the agency does does not do that. It's uh, spelled out in the uh, in the language of the uh, the bill that was passed, and uh, the the LEAs uh, have very broad flexibility in in their use. I think there's like twelve different uses categories that uh, they can use those funds on. But uh, again, the the thing to point out is that uh, CRF has a very short tail. It uh, ends this year. December 30, and then uh, the ESSER funds and the GEAR funds have a longer tail. They go out to uh, September of 22. Got it. Um, thanks for the reminder about, I forgot that they were, it was spelled out in that bill. Thank you. Yep. So a, a reminder on the HVAC, um, my understanding is, is if equipment is ordered but not yet installed, that that still uh, is reimbursable. So if you're, you're planning an HVAC, you know, redo, and you've got your contractor and you've, you've invested in, you know, purchasing, but have yet to install. I'm sorry, is that a question? That's a question to you, yes. It, it can't, is, that is still eligible, those funds are still el eligible for reimbursement for, through CRF. I've got it, I've got ready to go. I just haven't fully installed because I can't right now, <laughs> but I'm ready to go. Excuse me. 
So the the um, the HVAC again that that's part of CRF. So those those funds, if they have not uh, been spoken for as of twelve thirty, would have to uh, go back to the to the treasury. Um, there's obviously a, a period of time where you have uh, to invoice and pay those invoices, but uh, the work needs to. Uh, I believe the work has to be done. I will get. Uh, uh, I jump in, Madam Chair. Sure. Yeah, I, I think so. Because I think we did get some different, different, and I'm trying trying to verify. Yeah, Brad, please. I'm Brad James, Agency of Education. Just to clarify, what the what the CARES Act language says about CRF money is the costs have to be incurred by okay. December 30th. If they've ordered the equipment, that is incurring the cost. Um, okay. Paying for the equipment to have installed later is fine, but it has to be within a reasonable amount of time. Okay. Cost incurred is reimbursable. Um, any other questions regarding the, the funding? I know that we're going to have some questions on language. Um, Kathleen James. Sorry, I thought I hit unmute. Just to clarify, um, um, Bill, did you say the GEAR and ESSER funds both extend all the way out to September 2022? Yes, that is correct. Okay, thanks. Wow. I, I, have, I have to raise my hand on that one. I'm not sure that's right. I want to say it's September 21. Um, which is in FY22, but I don't think it goes out until 22. We'll have to check on that because I'm yeah. not 100% sure, but well, that's that's what I recall seeing. We do get tangled between our years and our FYs. We do. We do. Yeah. So I, I will check on that and get back to you all. Yeah. Okay. All right. Anything else on the numbers? We will go to the language. <clears throat> Amy, excuse me, Amy and Holly, what's your time limit? Hello, Madam Chair, Amy Schollenberger here. Um, I can stay as long as you want. Holly needs to jump off in a few minutes because she's presenting at a conference. Oh, like at nine o'clock? Yeah, uh, I think 9.05 she has until. Okay, can we just quickly, and Holly, if you have to go, go, but if we could um, open up, go to the language and jump right to, um, that section of the bill. And um, Holly, I'm just going to give the microphone to you because I know that uh, all that was changed from the bill that came over from the Senate were the dates and just wanted to give you a minute to speak. <clears throat> well, Madam Chair, this is Holly Morehouse with Vermont After School. Thank you um, so much for the time. I believe we're looking at page eight of, election, of, um, of 11, section B. Last one, yep. Yeah. 1120. Um, essentially, this is the language from the Senate. Of Keep going. Oh, yeah, never mind. Um, um, yeah, it starts about midway down the column uh, to create the task force for universal access um, after to after school. Um, and this is the, the language that Amy and I testified in your committee on um, the other week. And we support uh, the creation of this and um, the language as written. Um, any questions from Holly? I know that we've heard this. Uh, there's always this, we have a question always is how come there wasn't a student put on this? And do you have access to students? Yes, um, we do. We have I don't know why there wasn't one added here. Um, there is sometimes concern for tokenism um, in placing one student on an, an adult committee, but we do have access to youth after school ambassadors that come to the state house every year. We have 60 or 70 youth that have done that, including a number that have done it multiple years. And we also have a youth uh, statewide advisory group of 50 young people uh, that have been meeting all summer um, to work on a state youth council. And our programs have access to young people. So we could um, definitely incorporate youth voice uh, through um, those channels um, as well. And we, we do in, in all of what we do at Vermont After School, we could advocate for that on the task force. And you're in process of doing much of this anyway, is that correct? Yes, we. Um, I chaired the uh, Expanded Learning Opportunities Working Group that came up, uh, that wrote 
the reports that are, are cited um, in section C number three. Um, and we have kept that data and information up to date since that time. We also at Vermont After School have a current grant uh, of um, from a national funder to uh, continue to work on expanding access in underserved areas of the state. And we could use some of that money as well to support the data needs of the task force uh, in updating um, that work and, um, and any other data information they would need from the field. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Holly? She has a, a gigantic window of time here of about one minute. Um, Chip Conquest. Um, thank you. Uh, so I was, um, to be honest, I haven't had a chance to look through this closely, but um, I was asked to see about a report back to um, House and Senate uh, approaches and um, human services committees. I was just looking down here to see there are some reports already, um, but I. Um, I wondered what if you had a suggestion about a good time time frame for a report back to those committees um, would be. The current, I believe it's in section E, page 10, under meetings. There is a report uh, to the governor and to the House and Senate committees on education with findings and recommendations due on or before April 15th. 2021. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm not up to speed on this section, and I was just asked to ask you about that. So, um, but it looks like there's already a report back in here. Okay. Thank you. Yes. And I realize that the time um, is short, but we do have all the data. Some of the things that are listed in here, we have. Um, in place, we have maps on our website. Um, so I think that the task force could sort of, could start ahead and get up and running um, pretty quickly on that piece. Thanks. Thank you, Peter Fagan. Yes, thank you. So uh, Kate, I just I just went and talked to Ledge Council along with Joint Fiscal Office regarding the expenditure timeline for coronavirus relief fund monies. Mm -hmm. um, the everything must be installed and usable by the end of the year. If it is not installed, it will not be eligible for CRF. Now the bill may not yet be paid. That may still be, you know, going through the, the machinations of, of billing, but, uh, but it, uh, uh, a, an HVAC system must be installed and usable by the end of the year. Thank you, Peter. I didn't know, realize that. Yep. Well, that's unfortunate news. <laughs> I can. I, I asked Jen Carvey and Steve yeah. Klein at the same time. Both concurred with. Both said that. I wasn't sure what it was. I wanted to make sure both said that. Okay. Any other questions then for for Holly and and Amy? Thank you. Um, your your passion for this material comes through loud and clear. And um, thank you so much, Madam Chair. And um, as Amy said, she is able to stay on if questions further questions come up. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, um, Jim. Can you go through this language for us? Um, I see you conveniently <laughs> made it so that we can truly find the areas of of disagreement, I appreciate this. Um, uh, sure, so for the record, Jim Demery, this console. Um, so the green uh, is where the language is the same in both the House and Senate proposal of amendment. Uh, the yellow show differences in the blue are sections that are um, in one, but not the other. So um, in um, the first page here, uh, B111, you'll see the beginning is the same, but the appropriation amount is different. So you had 32, 4 million, and Senate has 53 million. And then when you come down to one, um, it's quite different actually. Um, so um, in one, 
on your side says uh, the funding is allocated to categories under subsections B, C, and D. Um, they have struck out D. So um, we'll come on to that later on, but the struck out is a million dollars that was appropriated for um, technical assistance in administration. So that's that was theirs. That was theirs. That was the Senate's in the beginning, anyway. <laughs> so. Yeah. So that's been struck out of yeah. there. That's why this reference to, to D has been deleted on their side. Um, and then it goes on. Okay. And you have looking at the left hand column for a minute. You've got oh, go up a little bit higher there. Um, well, thanks right there. Um, under one A, you have language that they've struck. So um, it says if the agency determines that any allocation to a category is likely not to be fully utilized by December 20, or based on its view of relative priority sh should be reallocated to another category, it may reallocate that funding to one or more other categories. <coughs> I believe that have that expenses. That was your language, and then there's B dealt with what happens between December 20 and 30, and then C is a report to the uh, Joint Fiscal Committee about any reallocations. The Senate side is taking a different tack, which is basically there's language uh, in the budget about reallocation more broadly. So you've take, take it, taken out language specifically here about allocation and relying on the other language in the budget to deal with reallocations. So what they say is that is the intent of the General Assembly that carries that funding appropriate to a AOE be used to ensure the safe opening operation of public schools um, during the state of emergency and the public schools use these funds to the maximum extent permitted by law. So they just, if we can sort of get this into, you know, user English, <laughs> um, this is just saying, this is just saying we're putting all the money together into one, one pool and reallocating it. Is this where that, this does this? It's basically you had given more discretion to the agency uh -huh. than I believe the sound was comfortable with. Okay. So the plan was on your side that it could, the agency could reallocate based on your relative priority has been taken out entirely. Um, and uh, this difference of dates between December 10 and 20 is gone now. Um, so the basically they've taken out that discretion and they say an intention uh, and said that the funding be used for pre-K through 12 to the maximum extent permitted. permitted. They're relying on other sections in terms of how a reallocation would work. Okay, questions? Okay, Phil, if you scroll down to two, um, right there, great, thanks. Uh, so now we, we are talking about um, HVAC and they have increased the appropriation. You had 11.5, they have 13.5. Likewise on C, you had 64, uh, 68.4, they have 88.3. They were taking a million dollars from the administration to get there and, and uh, 300,000 from independent schools to get there, which we'll come to. And then they've got, uh, they've taken out, you have three money sections in your bill. Uh, the third of those sections was the allocation for um, uh, food service equipment. Um, and that was up to 4 million. They have taken that section out entirely, which we'll come to. They've moved up language here instead. So they basically just, just um, abbreviated the language. So the tent is the same though, I believe, which okay. is, of these funds, up to four million um, may be distributed to AOE for the purchase of, of eligible um, supplies and equipment uh, for food. Um, so the, the substance is the same, but basically they moved into a different spot and shortened it. Um, and then go down below further to number two. Um, you have three, uh, the elliptical on your side means that, that this language in, in um, two and in D had not been changed in, in your proposal. So we have kept the independent schools at 1.5, we have kept the accounting and technical at one. They have changed that. So on their side, 
they've reduced the um, uh, allocation to independent schools to 1.2. Uh, they have eliminated the 1 million going to accounting and technical. And they have put in new language uh, that says that if the appropriate CARES Act funding proves to be insufficient to cover all reimbursable requests, any cost for new pandemic expenses shall be fully covered. Uh, and then proration for repurposed expenses that were freed up uh, from previously budgeted funds. So they have- Can I jump in here for just one second, Jim? Yeah. On that yeah. one line? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I should say, Madam Chair, my apologies. Um, Jim, that, that first sentence it, there, the, if the Appropriate Cares Act funding proves to be insufficient to cover all reimbursement requests, any cost for new pandemic expenses shall be fully covered to the extent that appropriated funds, period. It needs allowed or something like that in there. It doesn't make sense the way it's written. Yeah, she said to the extent of appropriated funds. Yeah, that's fine. It's just, it's just missing something. That's all. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I will go back. I'll, I'll, and I think that can be changed by the editors. I'll check. Yeah, that. yeah. Uh, and then um, going down further, so your uh, next section is the same. And uh, we're, we've gone through the numbers already, so we're, we think we're comfortable just. Yeah, this is the HVAC. This is basically a cross reference, so that's been updated. Um, and then going down to um, B113. As I mentioned, they deleted this language and moved it above in mm -hmm. the abbreviated form. So the substance is the same, but they've dealt with it differently. So they have struck out mm -hmm. your, your section B113. And then moving down further um, to the next section. Okay, same language for length of school year. Um, they have new language. You, you, have, you had language about the Australian ballot. They have struck that. So does that appear in the earth? So I understand that they sent that over to GovOps. Do you know what happened to that language from there? I'm not sure where it stands now. Sure. Okay. Hi, Kate. This is Holly yeah. Wexler from JFO. Yeah. Please. Um, that language is currently in S354. Thank you. On In section eight. Thank you. And the, it is in GovOps and they're gonna be taking it up today. Okay, thanks very much for that. No problem. Can I just ask Kate, um, yeah. uh, S354, is that one of your bills? No. No? Um, no, it's a GovOps bill. Uh, Chloe, what, what, what does that bill pertain to? Besides it looks like, and I, it is, I just pulled it up, um, an act relating to emergency provisions for the operation of government. Okay, uh, and is that one, does anybody want to weigh in on whether that one's likely to get through the process? Um, I know that I reviewed this language with the um, chair of uh, GovOps at the time, and she didn't have a problem with it, as I remember. So I imagine it's going to you guys, does your committee feel strongly about having this, the Australian ballot language? I mean, is that a priority of yours? It's, it's, if it's elsewhere, we're fine. <laughs> but, I get, I'm just trying to yeah. track it. Well, I, it's I, make it. Okay, I, I'm going to need to sort of review with the committee on that. But we did, we did send this language over in our bill. Um, we did send the Australian language over in our bill. It was struck and moved to someplace else. So it, it, I guess we just have to see what happens, happens from there. Um, okay, thanks. I would but assume I, that. Isn't it language. worth saying, though, that, that it's a very important piece of language, and if the other bill isn't going to happen, we, it, we it need to been. have this in the budget. Yes, that's fair. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, that reorganizing the question for me. Thank you. And it will just go through that with the committee um, and get the committees. Uh, okay. So we can keep going. Okay. Next section is B116. It's the same. same. So the um, waiver of the online teaching endorsement is the same. Yeah. The elections uh, for vacancies on uh, Unified Union School District Boards is the same. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then they have new language. So um, 
B118 is your ADM adjustment language, which is the, the AOE's recommendation. Uh, 119 is your reimbursement transportation expenses that we went through last week. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, um, and then okay, let's see. 1120 um, is the. Um, hey, Susan, can you mute? Susan Steitler, can you mute? Thanks. Okay, go ahead. Uh, B1120 is, is the wa uh, waiver uh, if a pre qualified program loses its status due to uh, loss of a qualified teacher. And then lastly, we went through the task force uh, earlier um, with Holly. So. Okay. Questions? Did we get sorted out what the transportation, a better understanding of what the transportation um, piece was? You can scroll back. Next one there. Right here. Oh, right. Okay. So what this is saying is that yeah. uh, normally uh, transportation expenses are reimbursed based upon uh, students um, being transported. Yeah. Um, just for food. <laughs> food and aid. Uh, so this is just saying if it's these expenses have not been reimbursed otherwise by federal funds, they will be reimbursed by the state um, under this section of law. Through using the CRF funds. If, if, if they're not already covered by CRF funds, they're yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Comments? Hey. Yeah. Casey, too. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just wanted to, uh, I had my hand raised up for the Australian ballot one. Yes. Um, I know we did talk about that. I did hear that it wasn't that, that bill. Um, but just to fill Representative Conquest in, um, I personally would like to see if we could. I don't know if it's anything we can do, but any kind of appropriation for that. Um, and I know I talked, Jeff Fannin talked for, from the NEA um, in support of this language being in there. Um, it's something that I think, you know, you have, um, why it's important to me, you know, you have, you have all these small towns getting together in a gymnasium and uh, trying to uh, come together in March, which is not that many months away. And uh, I think it's really important that we, when we look at setting out these, um, these ballots and having these initiatives on there, um, you know, something that we could look at right now, uh, being prepared for for March, um, and actually giving uh, our town clerks some kind of help sending out these ballots, um, similar to what we're doing for the November election. Um, so, a couple of things. Um, I mean, if that's if that's uh, something that your committee as a whole, um, you know, feels feel strongly about, um, you should certainly indicate that to us through a, um, a very brief memo or something. The other thing I would say though, is that it's very likely that we're gonna go straight to a committee of conference rather than um, um, concur with amendment. And so um, if it's not already in what's on the two sides, it's really difficult and perhaps impossible to add something new in the committee of conference in terms of funding. Um, but I would say that, um, you know, if you're talking about next March, there's budget adjustment, um, which will, you know, happen early in the session next year. And that, um, that would be in time to, um, to provide that funding for districts. Yeah. And thank you for that. I just, you know, I just wanted to just voice my concern on it just so you kind of knew Kind of where I stood and what uh, you know the NEA had, had said um, the other day or the other day I don't even know a couple of weeks ago when they were in here when we were talking about this but yeah I completely understand that but thank you. Yeah, so I appreciate hearing getting the heads up about it though. Um, Kate, can I ask one uh, question about the transportation expenses? Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe to Jim. So Jim, is this saying that if if those expenses are not covered by CRF? dollars that they would that it would be covered with general fund dollars by the state i believe the uh transportation expenses are covered by the ed fund oh sorry yeah yeah it makes sense um but it, th is that what that's saying then that would be the ed fund would cover it so yep. you're not understanding that right but, and, and did schools generally try to 
pay for that particular kinds of transportation with CRF dollars? That'd be a question for Brad, I think, more than me. I'm not sure what the facts are on that. Okay, but it, but it is saying that if those aren't are not covered with CRF dollars, that they will be covered with Ed Fund dollars. Correct. Okay. What 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 this is referring to instead of consequence is the reimbursement that happens on transportation costs two years down the road. It's roughly forty five percent that that is is reimbursed on their actual costs. The way the current language is written in in statute is the food the transportation of food costs would not be an eligible cost for to count, so they would not be able to even though they'd be incurring the cost they would not be getting reimbursed two years down the road at roughly forty five percent. So what this is doing is saying that those costs will be reimbursable at that point, but it is out of the education fund, and and a number of school districts did use for their school buses and are and. I, they, I'm sure they stopped. Well, I don't know, but did did use their school buses to deliver food to sort of that last portion of uh, last school year. So it's not really likely to be, in a sense, adding more to a school budget because they've already appropriate, they've already budgeted for transportation costs. They're just using it differently. Is that accurate? Yes. Yes. But do you know? Did most schools uh, are most schools trying to be reimbursed with CRF dollars for those costs? I, I don't know because I haven't looked through enough budgets to answer that question succinctly or accurately. Okay, thank you. We're, we're just, we're just, in, this is language is just saying, hey, if your buses were running right. and they were delivering school food, we're going to think of that as similar to uh, picking up kids if you haven't, if you haven't gotten the appropriate. Uh, right, and, and, and that, that, that will count towards their, their um, transportation aid in, in a future year. Mm -hmm. Is this, um, I'm just trying to get a sense whether there's likely, if this is likely to have any significant impact on the, the, that cost in the Ed Fund. I, it, so, so we're looking, we're looking two years down the road, uh, transportation costs are, uh, the transportation aid, I keep saying cost, I mean aid, is roughly $15 million. Um, on, you know, just over the court each year. Um, so my, my guess is that it'll, that it will have some impact on it, will probably lower it somewhat, how much I don't know at this point, but it, it, it may decrease it somewhat. Okay, thanks, that's helpful. Yeah. And, and while, while I'm on, if, if I may, um, both Bill and I were talking with Kathy Flanagan, our deputy CFO, who does the finance or the uh, business side of the world. Mm -hmm. um, she did specify that ESSER funds are good up through September 22, so Bill was right, I was wrong, the second time I was wrong, that's good. Um, <laughs> So well, you're never wrong. So, so we know we know you're human. <laughs> okay, good. I'm wrong quite a bit. But but so anyway, the, the ESSER funds are good through September of 22. And that's because of the tidings amendment, which allows an additional nine months or something like that for federal monies. Okay. Okay. Are there questions or comments? Um, excuse me a minute. Okay, seeing none. Um, thank you. We're going to move to higher ed from here. Hey, Madam Chair. Yes. I did get an answer on your question about uh, how many people or how many LEAs are using the uh, the new chart of accounts. Yeah. So every single one of the uh, LEAs that is live, which is 19 currently on eFinance Plus is using it. And then our team is also working with all the LEAs to collect the stat book data using the new chart of accounts. So mm -hmm. we'll keep you posted on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know how much we really want to get this organized. Absolutely. Uh, is that also interfering with some of the, the or maybe it's the uh, SSDDMS that's that's interfering with our recent um, uh, being put under supervision by the federal government related to our um, special ed? Is that partially related to that or in, in data collection or is it? Other, other factors, I'd probably ask you. SSDDMS and eFinance Plus are one and the same. Yeah. Perhaps you're referring to SLDS, which was a project. Uh, yeah, right, you're right. 
that went live a couple of years ago. Yeah. Okay, that's another question. I'm sorry to open that can of worms. But we'll we'll be talking about that though next year for sure. Um, okay, so um, can we get the side by side on higher ed? I think Jim sent one. Okay, so Jim, can you um, go through this? So um, this is the same color scheme as before. Green's the same, yellow is different. Um, so the first uh, difference here, so you both have um, appropriate $10 million in three for the independent colleges. Um, uh, they have added this language on the right-hand side in yellow that says distribution factors to be considered include but not limited to CARES Act funding guidelines, uh, creating a floor to, put, um, to protect smaller schools. There should be an and in there too. Um, um, so they have some factors to consider here in terms of uh, allocation to the 11 colleges where you don't have that factor. Um, and then You've got language on your side that says the funds are for specific purposes. So you're talking about technology, remote instruction. Their version of that is, is for basically anything that meets the guidelines. So they have less restriction uh, on the use of these funds. Then for UVM in four, uh, you each have a $10 million appropriation. Um, however, um, they have additional language um, this is below, it says, for the duration of the governor's state of emergency, uh, the university shall present to the House and Senate Committees on, on Appropriations and Education, as well as the UVM community, uh, a full specific quarterly accounting of all funds appropriated and expended during the span of time covered by the state of emergency order. And two, the revenue loss projections upon which the university University's present and future budget cuts are premised. And how those projections are out as actual data becomes available. Do you know um, where this came from and what the reasoning for it was? I don't. You I'm don't. not sure. I was a part of that discussion. Okay. So this happened. It, this happened in um, Senate appropriations because this. I don't think this was in the the uh, recommendation from the Senate Education Committee. I don't remember seeing this. It was not. It was not, okay. So this is new. Um, okay, so Sue Steitley, oops, let me just see if there are questions here first. Sue Steitley, did you wanna comment on this? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, thank you for having me today. Uh, the Senate felt that we should have some um, sense of what an equitable distribution meant uh, so that we included that language so that we could make sure that the smaller institutions were adequately taken care of. Uh, that's why we added some distribution factors in there. Um, and we also made it broader to include anything that's eligible uh, in accordance with the federal guidelines. Um, the, original version, which had, you know, PPE, cleaning, remote instruction, you heard from SIT, uh, they don't have mo many, most of those costs, uh, or even room and board. So we needed, and each college is different and has different costs. So the broader language keeps it in compliance with the federal guidelines, but allows the institutions to, um, you know, get reimbursed for the costs that they actually have. So it, it's more equitable in that the smaller institutions we may not have some of these costs. We'll still have other costs that apply. Okay, great. So this this works for your. Yes, it does work for us. Okay. Um, and then um, Wendy Koenig, UVM. Maybe you maybe you were following this and know where this came from. Um, I, I actually, uh, when this language was introduced, um, was not part of the discussion, so I'm not aware of the origins of it, um, but did want to say thanks for having us in this morning to speak about it, and first and foremost want to um, thank 
both House and Senate uh, appropriations and education for um, this additional um, appropriation, which will be very helpful uh, to the university, particularly in helping um, fulfill some needs via financial aid for Vermont students whose families have had some revenue loss during this time. Um, as to this language, I think that um, the university does not have any problem at all sharing um, an accounting of all funds appropriated and expended um, for CRF dollars. Um, I think that our expectation was that we would have to do that anyway. Um, and obviously um, we're very grateful for the, all of the appropriations we've received um, for CRF funding and do feel that it's appropriate to give the legislature a full accounting of those dollars. Um, I will say that um, where I find this somewhat confusing is that I don't know why it's only um, inclusive of the University of Vermont. I would imagine that the legislature would have an interest in having all institutions that receive CRF funds do the same. Um, it seems that you would want to know how all of us are, are spending these dollars, not just the university. And um, I, I'm not saying that this was the intent behind it, but by only singling out UVM, it could seem to some that um, the legislature has doubts about our ability to appropriately spend the funds. Um, and I think that that is, is not warranted. Um, if I'm looking at uh, sub B in, in the language where it says revenue loss projections upon which the university's present and future budget cuts are premised and how those projections bear out as actual data becomes available, um, I, I do think it's somewhat unusual and different for the legislature to be asking us for information about how we create our own budgets. That has not been um, something that we've done for all of you in the past. And it seems to be delving a little bit into um, the way that the university does its own um, budget and projections. So I, I am concerned about that sub B. Um, and I think- this, this is unrelated to, this B is unrelated to um, COVID, correct? Or is this related to, to COVID? This... Well, um, if, if you know, for the, if, if we look at the language at the beginning for the duration of the governor's state of emergency orders, my assumption is that the intent is that it's related to COVID, but the language doesn't specify that in sub B. And so um, that does concern me a little bit. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, again, the other thing that everyone should be aware of is that as a public institution, um, our financials are public information already. Um, and the other thing is that since we receive public funding from the legislature for our regular annual appropriation, we do report to the state on a monthly basis. And I believe the term is, um, and Representative Fagan, if he's on, can correct me if I get this wrong, but there's warrant language that says that with our appropriation, we need to provide financial information monthly to the state of Vermont about how we spend the appropriation and, and how that fits into our financials. So we are already currently reporting monthly to the state about our financial situation. So you don't correct. know where and when this language came from. Hi, Peter, you're joining us. No, we're, that's correct. We're just, so you you heard this. We're, we're just trying to understand- been here where the whole this, time, Kate. Yeah, I've you been have, here the whole time, yes. Oh, good, good, good. We're just trying to understand where this language comes, comes from, why it's necessary, yeah. and uh, I can't say that I'm totally getting it. Maybe you have some. I, I have no insight. Uh, I'm right there with you. I have no insight. Yeah. Okay. And so, Jim, this was, you didn't write this language then? Jim. I didn't write this language, no. Okay. It was just dropped in <laughs> some moment. So, but it appeared, when did, when did it appear? I'm just trying to see which, which uh, YouTube I should watch. <laughs> We don't know. Never don't mind. Know. It'll keep me from watching YouTube's that I don't need to watch. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Um, Serena Austin. Yep, I just want to share when I read that language as well, it, it just kind of struck me as odd as well. And I feel like it implies an underlying unwarranted concern. And I would be really curious to see, you know, what, what the intent of that language is. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, okay. Kate. Yes. Kate, I, I have a quick question. And mm -hmm. this is really probably for um, Representative Fagan. And that is uh, at least in terms of accounting for all funds appropriated. Um, here it's really designed to, to ask that of UVM. But in the language for the state colleges, is there a similar requirement? Not at this time. <clears throat> the, the, and I'm trying to remember what we put into the Q1 budget as far as reporting requirements. I don't think that there was anything so extraordinarily specific as the language that you're looking at that was in there. It's, it, it's, but there may have been because we need to in three years, typical time frame when an audit comes back to look at you. Uh, be able to pull something up and read it and then remember and say, I remember what we did with it. It's right here. And this is how we used it it's to be able to then prove uh, that we were in accordance with the CARES Act uh, guidelines. Yeah. So having the, the accounting, which, which UVM, off, they do provide uh, because of the warrants and the Vermont State Colleges also do the warrant process um, is, is fine. Duplicating the, the need is probably it, not a bad thing. You know, it's just mm -hmm. Just a reminder and probably not a bad thing. Thank you. Okay, so I'm sorry I got distracted by that conversation um, during that conversation, Peter. So I, I'm, if I repeat myself in here, please, please save the committee and interrupt me. Um, could I, let's take the document down. I just want to um, look at the, the committee. So in terms of um, the higher ed portion, um, is it fair to say that uh, we, have, we have questions about the um, additional language in the UVM portion? Okay. And is it fair to say then you're okay with the AVIC language or the, the independent college language? Okay. So that's what we'll be saying to you, Peter Fagan. We'll send, send that to you. Um, and if we go to the, um, if we go to the uh, pre-K language. Um, hold on a minute. Let me... Thanks for having us. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yeah. If a uh, question, so if, um, Understand. I understand where you're coming from. You know, yeah. you have you have a problem with the language. Are you going to be recommending language? Would you like me to work with UVM to come up with something different? Um, what's your pleasure, please? Yeah, sure. Um, why don't we Why don't we talk? Um, why don't you and I have a chat? Um, do that. Yeah. Go Go ahead and start a conversation with. If it's going straight to committee of conference, then um, you know, we, we can work on it through there. Otherwise, happy to, to have a flat conversation yep. with you. And I you believe know. that's that's the direction we'll go. That was what I recommended last night in a uh, in a committee chat. So okay, I, I can't can't say that is absolutely what we're going to do, but that's where I think the committee's heading. Okay, thank you, Peter Fagan. We we um, you. really really loved having you join us. Well, I really do appreciate the the committee digging in. I've said it time and again. Um, you know, you've been of, of extraordinary help. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, if we look at, no, where did it go? Here it is. So in terms of the numbers, um, anything glaring on the numbers that, that Chloe sent out? Are we going to basically be okay with the numbers as written so far? And we'll let appropriations deal with any. Yeah, so we'll, we'll be okay with that. Um, so I think the only thing that really stands out for us at this point is um, 
making sure that the Australian ba ballot language um, exists somewhere. And if not, that it should stay. And keeping in mind that it probably would be something to flag for, um, to e either flag for uh, the Joint Fiscal Committee or just remind appropriations that it might cost something. Um, and then the ADM language. Um, this is what the, this is basically the, it's basically just a, as we know, it's a, it is a zero sum game, um, but Kathleen, James. Yeah, thanks, Kate. Um, I just want to raise it because um, it, it's an issue in my region that's come to my attention. And I know that there are really legitimate um, points to be made on both sides. Um, but we've talked a little bit um, about Wynn Hall, which is a full choice um, district in my region. Um, and they've seen a, a kind of an unprecedented um, population explosion um, due to the pandemic and um, are facing a $1 million budget shortfall um, in the number of kids that they need to tuition in. And I just wondered if we could have a quick um, talk about whether there might be any options for them. And I don't, I don't know what ideas are. I don't know if um, you know anybody from JFO has any ideas, but I just wanted to raise that because it's been brought to my attention as a as a problem of a $1 million unexpected budget shortfall that a school in my region is facing. So I, I at least wanted to raise the issue. So Chloe, that could be eligible for CRF, is that correct? And they, could, they could put in for CRF. Hi, okay. Chloe Wexler. Um, that would be a, you know, a, a, um, a legal interpretation, but it is possible, I would, I would imagine that at least for, you know, from September to December, they could possibly request reimbursement for those unanticipated tuition costs. It wouldn't cover the full year, but um, I, I do think that could be an option. And I, if Brad is still on, maybe he can speak to that as well. Yeah, Brad. I'm, I'm still on, but I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that question. My, my initial thought is I'd be a little bit surprised if that was eligible, but I, I don't know. Um, I'll try to figure out who to ask about that. Um, I do know that, that Wynn Hall and a few other towns down in your area, Representative James, have had this issue before where people have moved up um, unexpectedly. Um, what this what this language currently does says that their count will be no less than, than the current number. So that means that any increase will be counting. So that will help them too. But it, that doesn't address the uh, deficit issue that you're bringing up. So I, I, I don't know whether this would be eligible for CRF or not. Now I will check in. What um, about, um, I have a couple of questions. I just, see, I just see Jim Demare is raising his hand, so he might be able to answer part of that. So let's let's get that and then get to your second question. Okay. Okay. So Jim Jim Demare. Yeah. So to say that these costs are being incurred due to the um, pandemic. Um, so whether you're an operating district and have kids moving in after your budget has been approved, you have additional costs, or a tuition district which is paying tuition and is incurring non-budgeted costs due to people moving in because of the pandemic. I believe there's a good case to be made on both fronts uh, for operating and tuition districts that CRF funds could be used um, for these purposes. However, there would have to be some control to, uh, for school districts to know that that's the reason these kids moved into their district. Um, so it might be checking with parents or whatever, but um, I would say too, it's for only the first half of this year, if it is eligible. Um, and um, wherever is done or not done, the ADM will catch up. So um, next year, when we do the two year rolling average ADM to calculate equalized peoples, the increase will be counted and they'll get a tax benefit next year. So if you were to provide funding for these students this year, you also have to make an ADM adjustment so they don't get the double benefit of federal funds and the benefit of the ADM adjustment. Thank you. 
that's really helpful. Kathleen. Yeah, I was just also going to ask, I mean, you know, I raised the issue of Windhall just because they're, you know, right next door and they've brought it to my attention. So I don't know if I, you know, I'm not trying to be inequitable. I don't know if there are other districts around the state that are um, choice like that, that are in a similar situation. Um, Ski homes. <laughs> yeah, and I also don't know whether, um, if, you know, I know I'd heard, I mean, they're, you know, in different conversations, I've heard about this. I don't know whether, you know, I mean, this, this is not a new situation for Wynn Hall. Um, it's just, un, it's just worse than ever before, right? So, um, and it's it's pandemic related. So if they were to take out a loan to cover and some portion of that were to be attributed to COVID, I, I'm just trying to think of some fair way to acknowledge that something happened to Wynn Hall this year that is COVID related, that was truly beyond their control, that happened after March. You know, I mean, from talking to their board chair, um, you know, Wynn Hall passed a responsible budget that included a responsible number of ghost students based on historic trends. And then, you know, then COVID happened and they had, I'm not looking at the numbers right now, and they had 50, you know, 50 tuition students either move in or move to their vacation homes or buy homes in the area. And, you know, they're in a region of our state um, that's gonna attract a higher number of new homeowners or new families just because of where they're located. You know, people from Boston or people New York, from New York um, are gonna be maybe more likely to buy there or, or move there. And these are new families coming to our state and that's, that's a good thing. So, um, so I don't know, I, I just, I bring it up. I don't necessarily know what the answer is, but you know, I don't want the session to end and the budget to move on without us at least thinking about it. And I know it's late in the game, but there you have it. Peter Conlon. Yeah, I, the, the challenge of course with, with Wynn Hall, as Jim said, is that um, if, you, if you fund the tuition that they're paying because they don't operate any schools, and then the ADM catches up and they get a, a, a serious tax rate change. How do you balance that? Because they will benefit from a higher enrollment. Well, I don't know if benefits the right word since they don't operate any schools, but the ADM will catch up in terms of their reimbursement. Um, so to me, it's, it's a short-term deficit problem that they have. Um, and um, it is a little late in the game, but you know, if, if they need to borrow money, I would certainly um, think it'd be a good idea to at least try to get them interest-free money because this certainly is a, a COVID-related issue. Larry Coopley. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, is, is it, it's been my understanding that COVID funds cannot be used to correct or balance budgets. I could be very wrong, but uh, maybe Jim or Brad can chime in on that. Um, yeah, so this is a case where you're back to own revenue. Uh, this is a case where you're incurring unbudgeted costs. Um, so if there's back to own revenue for the state or maybe for a locality, that could be an issue. But here we have unanticipated costs due to COVID-19. Um, I believe those costs could be eligible for, for reimbursement using zero funds. Um, in terms of the loan, um, just by rough calculation, if you have a million dollar loan to cover these costs, and let's say you have a 5% interest rate, that's 50,000 bucks in interest, you can only use that for funds to cover a portion of that interest because they can't go beyond December 30. So maybe it's a $25,000 uh, use of federal funds to cover uh, interest on that loan. Um, so just to put that into perspective, and I believe that might already be, be eligible. So I'm not sure that there needs to be more to be done on that. 
um, if, 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 because the CRF funding usually comes with no strings aside from being eligible. So it might be that they could use that, the funds already for that, that purpose. Okay, we're coming to the end. We're doing the floor in 10 minutes. Um, and I, I did see, um, Phil, did you send out a, a meeting on Wednesday? Did we have a meeting Wednesday? I didn't. <laughs> um, we have not talked about having a meeting on Wednesday. There was talk about maybe having a meeting on Friday. Right. Oh, okay. I thought I saw something come through on Wednesday and I was going, I didn't remember that. So, <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, we will have a meeting on Friday. This will be a meeting um, related to uh, uh, masks. There's, uh, we passed a resolution uh, last week uh, celebrating mask day and there are a bunch of students who are going to come and speak to us. I thought it would be nice for us to actually hear from some students on the last day of, of our session, what I'm assuming is the last day. And um, we will, that should be it. So, um, and as I understand, um, the task force um, uh, likely to um, possibly not have a problem with that at this point. And I will confer with um, appropriations on that. So I think with that, we can end the meeting. And um, I thank everybody. Thank you, um, some of the people I bet I won't see for a while. Oh, Jeff Francis, did you have anything to add? I'm sorry. Uh, the ADM issue might be the thing that you're most interested in. And Jeff Fannin. Jeff Fannin to up. Yeah. Hi. Good morning. Um, the ADM language uh, is um, important. Uh, I like the Senate's numbers, but I think that's just based on information that we've gathered since you folks passed the budget, and mm -hmm. I think that's important to to acknowledge. Um, I did ask the question about the Representative Tooth mentioned about. Uh, the Australian ballot, I, I thank Chloe for clarifying it's an S-354. I'm gonna have to look at that. I've been juggling a couple things and so I haven't had a chance to look at that, but I will. It's section eight, I think Chloe said, and I will look at that. Um, and um, the ADM, I, I tend to agree, we've got to do something about it. And I, the, the sentence language looks to be um, helpful in that regard. And I, I think just something has got to be done to address the issues that we're, we know are out there. Um, so just hold people, essentially holding people harmless is the important way to go. However we do it, I think we support that. Um, I'm trying to keep this quick because I know you folks are heading to the floor. Um, da, 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 da. All right, I think I'll just keep it as simple as that. Uh, thank you and thank happy you. to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Francis, did you have anything? I, I just want to thank you for your work in its entirety. We support the um, the proposals of amendment from the Senate, not in any way, shape, or manner because we don't honor your work. We think that they had the benefit of more time and the ability to respond to what you had created for them to respond to. So I I. Thank you for your work. We support the Senate's proposal of amendments. We think the ADM language is important. And I think the money um, allocations are reflective of what the need is. So in summary, thank you. And we do support the Senate's proposals of amendment. Thank you. It's unfortunate since some of these things have to go into the budget, but we are in the middle of a global pandemic. Um, so things are not being done in its usual highly organized, well-structured uh, end of the session. It is even more chaotic than usual. Okay, so I think that's it. Thank you everybody and thank you, Brad. Good to see you.